As of late, I have been modeling, or following the model rather, of our dear senior pastor. I've gotten addicted to Netflix. <laughs> While I was traveling recently, I found out that you can actually download episodes of your favorite TV shows and keep them on your mobile device so that when you're disconnected from the cloud or the internet, say when you're in an airplane, you can binge watch whatever you'd like. So this has changed the way that I fly. Last week, when I was in airports, I was downloading episodes of their new series, The Crown, and I was binge watching them on the plane. It's been wonderful. The Crown, for those of you who have not started down this black hole of television consumption, follows the early years of Queen Elizabeth II of England. In one of the first episodes, it shows the dramatic days when she with her husband were in Nairobi, Kenya on vacation when her father passed away in his sleep. Immediately after hearing the news, arrangements were made for her to return home to be with her family, to make funeral arrangements and the like. In the moments when her plane lands in London, a series of events unfold that appear to change her in mere moments. The plane lands and her assistant bids her a final farewell before the assistant to the king comes before her and discusses the next steps. Before she even leaves the plane, she's given a new dress, she's been given a letter from her grandmother sharing the importance of her new role. Her husband, Prince Charles, is held back to exit the plane after she exits the plane instead of accompanying her as in the past. A royal procession awaits her at the end of the stairway from the airplane, and a new series of responsibilities find her the moment her feet touch British soil. Princess Elizabeth Windsor had left Nairobi, but as the people changed their actions around her, and as new attire was given to her and new responsibilities were given to her, the Queen, Elizabeth Regina of England, emerged revealed through the death of her father, through her new attire, the greetings of those that respected her, the kneeling of her sister and mother and husband, and in the declarations that arose nearby, long live the queen. We're in a season of epiphany, a time when we reflect on who Christ is and how Christ is revealed to us. December 25th ushered in that day when it was proclaimed with great joy and celebration from the mountains and the valleys, from the halls of royalty and in the squalor of a stable that our Lord and Savior had come to the world as an infant, as a child. We are given the opportunity to reflect on what that means for us, what it means for God to have come to humanity as a helpless infant, to a poor young family in the dirt and grime of a barn. Last week, we were able to reflect on what it meant that strangers from a faraway land came to celebrate the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, bearing with them gifts of frankincense, gold, and myrrh, and what that means for us, that from a land that has no connection to Israel, people traditionally believed to be outside of God's, outside of God's grace and promise, had come to honor the birth of the Christ, and also bearing with them gifts symbolizing wealth, worship, and burial. And this week we consider what it means for us that Christ came to the riverside where his cousin John was baptizing those who were asking to seek wholeness in preparation of the promised one, the one who would be the savior of God's people. Just as when Her Majesty Elizabeth Windsor was indicated to be queen by the actions of those around her, in a way, Jesus of Nazareth has his true reality exposed by the actions of those around him in this setting. According to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus had been living in the land of Nazareth before coming to the Jordan to be baptized. It is believed that he would have been well into his adulthood probably close to 30 years old. Very little is written about Jesus between his birth and this point of his life. 
The book of Matthew has nothing between his family's return to Galilee and his baptism. Many assume that Jesus probably lived a normal life, probably in the profession of his father, a construction worker, a carpenter, a blue-collar worker from Nazareth, following the life and traditions of every other Jew, until that day when he went to the Jordan. There he met his cousin John, who had been proclaiming for years the promised one was coming. The promised one who would baptize with fire, who would save God's people, who is so worthy of honor that John believed himself not worthy to untie Jesus' sandals. And yet here he is to be baptized by John, no less. John refuses initially, but is reminded by Jesus that John had been called to baptize and to prophesy, and even Jesus needed to be baptized, for it was in God's will. God had planned it to be that way. And that is where this sense of revelation begins. Jesus of Nazareth descends into the river, is baptized, and emerges. And in that moment when he emerges, the skies open. John sees the Holy Spirit descend in the form of a dove, and God's voice is heard, proclaiming that Jesus is God's beloved Son. John Calvin writes some commentary on this, and so I'm going to use his thoughts to unpack some of this. First, Christ's humanity and divinity and its connection through us through baptism. Jesus had come to John to be baptized, just like every other person that was there. Like every Christian after him, baptism was a part of his physical life. In our humanity, we come to be baptized, and in his humanity, Jesus came to be baptized at the river. Even though John was hesitant to do so, Jesus knew of the importance of having this connection to his followers, the ones that would come thereafter. It was symbolic of the physical act that joins us with Christ, that joins our broken humanity with his perfect existence. It's a physical sign and act that reminds us of the temporal act, the temporal, the physical, the the space that Jesus was in and the physical world that we too are in. It's a connection and an example for us, a sign and symbol for our humanity to connect with Christ's humanity. In taking those steps with his human body, his feet that were probably dirty, his hands that were probably calloused into the very physical cold and wet water of the Jordan River, this was an act that proclaimed to those that were present and to all of us since that our Lord really was very human and connected to us in that way. Second, baptism anoints us with a call to ministry. Until this point, Jesus was pretty low-key in the ministry work he was doing. Matthew's gospel doesn't, doesn't mention any previous ministry. It's understood that until this point, Jesus arises from his baptism and goes forth from this point forward into his service in the kingdom of God. As he arises from the water, it's as if something changes. The heavens open and God's spirit descends upon Jesus. He goes from that place not to do more carpentry work, but the gospels begin to follow his ministry, his miracles, his preaching, the calling of his disciples and his teaching. This event in the Gospels is the single most important marker of the beginning of his ministry. It's a significant fulfillment of prophecy to service to God's kingdom. And likewise, in our baptism, we believe that we have been anointed with God's Spirit, called to serve the kingdom of God. We believe that anything and everything we do is a part of our work to serve the kingdom of God, and That specific work is given to us through our baptism. Those who are elected and ordained to serve as elders or deacons, 
and as pastors and Christian educators, are all affirmed of their calling through the baptism. This is something we do in our tradition and in our liturgy. Anyone who takes time to support the grieving, to help the poor, anyone who spends time in worship or supporting the work of the church, anyone who advocates for the oppressed, who serves through educating of our children and one another, anything we do in our service for God is a result of our being called to serve, symbolized through the waters of baptism. Through baptism, Christ began his work of ministry. And through baptism, we are all marked for service in God's kingdom. Third, the dove is a symbol of Christ's grace and peace. Christ arose from the waters with the heavens opening above him and the spirit descending in the form of a dove. The spirit appears to ascend throughout scripture in the form of fire. So why a dove here? John Calvin says that this is because Christ is himself a symbol of peace and grace for God's people. Christ shared in the full power of the Holy Spirit, but Christ's power is not to intimidate us. Rather, it is to be a sign of comfort for us. Jesus is the all-powerful Savior, strong enough to conquer all evil, but gracious enough to comfort us in times of trouble, forgiving us when we've done wrong. Finally, God's voice is the strong declaration that we belong to God. As he arose from the waters, God's voice was heard saying, This is my Son, my Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. In baptism, Jesus arose with the affirmation of who he was and what God was calling him to do, with the sure knowledge that he was doing it properly. In baptism, we are marked to be God's, and we can be sure that God is saying to us, you are my child, and I love you. In baptism, we are marked as being part of God's family, and we are marked with all of those rights and privileges of that status. Baptism is a sacrament that has huge significance for us, And it teaches us so many things. In his own baptism, Jesus is revealed to us as being human and yet as divine, as God's son. In his baptism, Jesus is revealed to us to be human and is initiated into his ministry. Marked as belonging to God, he is descended upon by the Holy Spirit and revealed to be gracious and powerful. In his baptism, we see Christ being revealed in new and powerful ways. And while we stand in awe of this baptized, spirit-anointed, son of humanity and son of God, we are reminded that we too have been baptized, that we have been baptized with Christ's baptism. In a major way, we are reminded of our relation to Christ. In fearful adoration, We are comforted by our inclusion in this mission, in this appointment, in this calling, and in this affirmation. In the power of the Holy Spirit, in the sending forth by God's mission, in the sure knowledge of God's grace, and in the amazing declaration that we belong to God, may we go into this world accepting our own calling and owning our identity, baptized in Christ. Amen.